So next we have Randy Jackson, whose grassland ecology group studies how carbon and nutrients flow into, within, and out of grassland ecosystems. And again, more info on each speaker can be found at the bottom of the session page. Randy, take it away. Thank you so much, Danny, and thank you to the group for inviting me. It's a pleasure to share some work that we've been doing in the upper Midwest uh, in Wisconsin and uh, and talk about how it's related to this notion of climate smart agriculture and, and soil health. Uh, and I'm just going to be clear that I'm going to be, oh, planting a flag pretty strongly here on what I think uh, climate smart ag uh, is and uh, what, what healthy soil really is. And um, the bottom line is uh, the data seem to indicate to us that uh, in order to have these kinds of things, we really need transformative agricultural change or transformative agroecological change. And so I wanna talk a little bit about that today. So what you see here in this picture is uh, uh, an example of what I uh, think is climate smart agriculture that's uh, developing and generating healthy soil. This is a well-managed grazing system in uh, the Wyoming Valley of Wisconsin, the Cates Farm. Uh, they've been farming it this way for over uh, 30 years. And the stream that's meandering through this farm was recently classified by the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources as a class one trout stream. And anglers come from all around the world to, uh, to fish this, uh, this kind of uh, stream in the driftless area uh, of Wisconsin. This work is uh, all uh, part of this uh, overall effort we call Grassland 2.0. It's a USDA funded CAP project. The idea of Grassland 2.0 is that we uh, humans need, deserve, and need to demand uh, agricultural systems that more closely resemble the function of the original grassland biome where we do most of our agriculture. That notion emerges from the work of one of our Wisconsin stalwarts uh, up in our pantheon of uh, conservation uh, uh, folks, and that's Alda Leopold, who of course uh, left us with a lot of um, uh, a lot of pearls of wisdom. But one, the the one that I like the most, that uh, sort of distills down to this notion that when we take care of the land, we really are taking care of ourselves, and and that's an identity that we can't uh, that we can't separate, and that when we do try and separate it and parse it out, that we do so at our at our great peril. So um, there's a lot of conversation about regenerative agriculture and what is that, what could it be? Um, certainly, if you look over here on the left uh, of this slide, uh, you can see a form of agriculture that was pervasive throughout uh, the late 19th and, and most of the 20th century, and frankly continues today in the 21st century. Let's just call it extractive agriculture, and that's not to throw anybody under the bus, it's just the it's the system that we've evolved and the system that we've converged upon, but that system cracks open uh, usually grasslands and um, over time mines the carbon and uh, that's that's been built up in those grasslands over the millennia. So here's an example, a little cartoon from Brady and Weil showing this very thing. Uh, if this is organic matter on the y-axis and the time since cultivation. Uh, you can see here that total carbon precipitously declined after these prairie uh, prairies and grasslands were carved up, uh, but that the loss of carbon over time continued and continues to this day as we continue to, to mine the carbon that has accumulated, the energy that's accumulated in those soils. And so regenerative agriculture, in my mind, uh, is really about trying to restore the function of that original prairie and set us off on a new trajectory where carbon uh, is actually accumulating in a system. And to me, that's uh, real world climate smart agriculture because in that situation, we would actually be taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it in soils rather than emitting carbon to the atmosphere. So um, lest we be too myopically focused on carbon and climate, although the climate emergency is upon us and we have to do something about it uh, now. Uh, we, th these extractive systems come uh, with, what comes with them is all kinds of water quality and water quantity problems. Uh, I'm sure I'm lecturing to the choir here. Uh, biodiversity uh, is significantly undermined. 
by our current systems. We, there's estimates that uh, in North America, uh, since the year 1970, we have lost over 3 billion birds in uh, North America, largely due to the way we configure and manage our agricultural landscapes. Uh, but it's just been devastating uh, at, at continental scales, but also devastating at local scales, uh, where um, really the waterways in, in and around uh, Madison, Wisconsin, and throughout the upper Midwest, and, and it's not unique to the upper Midwest either, um, are basically unusable. Uh, EPA calls it impaired, uh, but in many respects, they're unusable for much of the year. Essentially, they've become manure lagoons, uh, just, just to be frank about it, where we put so many nutrients into the system uh, that the uh, organisms in the system take up all those nutrients and choke off oxygen for further growth of other organisms. So with all that doom and gloom, uh, we might ask what cropping systems might actually be regenerative. And again, I've, I've kind of planted a flag here that to me, regenerative means we're actually gaining more carbon than losing carbon uh, every year. And uh, thankfully, uh, my, my colleague who sadly passed away in uh, 2012, Josh Posner, started uh, what we call the Wisconsin Integrated Long uh, Cropping Systems Trial, a long-term experiment that was started in 1989. So it's about 32 years old now. Um, it's a massive experiment of side-by-side -side cropping systems. There's four replications of each one of these cropping systems, uh, each phase of every uh, rotation in place every year. So it's a lot of plots, uh, a lot of overhead to maintain and manage this. And uh, it's everything from continuous corn to well-managed uh, rotational grazing of perennial grasslands. And what we have are three cash grain systems, the intensive corn managed uh, with the best genetics every year, uh, with uh, high inputs of fertilizer and um, uh, herbicides and pesticides. Uh, the corn and bean rotation managed in an intensive way with uh, minimum tillage and, uh, and, and managed in a way that's very similar to much of the rotational systems in the upper Midwest. An organic system that has cover crops, uh, of a cover crop phase of wheat, but it's corn, soybeans, followed by some clover for nitrogen, and then going back into corn and managed organically. Very typical dairy forage rotation to the upper Midwest corn followed by three years of alfalfa again with the Roundup Ready alfalfa and the best corn genetics, et cetera. An organic corn oats cover crop alfalfa rotation and then finally that rotationally grazed cool season pasture. So those six cropping systems have been in place since 1989. And fortunately, uh, soil carbon was uh, estimated in 1989 down to one meter depth. Our soils are about one meter deep on top of glacial till. Below that one meter is just rubble and, and gravel left behind by the glaciers. So we're essentially sampling the entire soil uh, uh, profile here. Uh, we came back in 2009, and by we, I mean uh, grad student extraordinaire Greg Sanford, who's now a research scientist in, in our group, uh, came back and sampled those soils again to look at the carbon change over a 20 year period. So here's Greg here, uh, waxing poetic in front of some uh, uh, cropping systems. The takeaway message from his uh, PhD work was very clear. Uh, all the systems in that, um, in that uh, experiment were losing a significant amount of carbon over that 20 year period, except for the rotationally grazed pastures, which neither gained nor lost carbon significantly, held on to what they'd started with. Um, but that's a little bit misleading in that uh, if you look at just the 30 centimeters, the surface 30 centimeters, in fact, the pasture did gain a significant amount of carbon, but from 30 to 90 centimeters, significantly lost carbon enough to offset those gains at, at the surface uh, uh, horizon. And in fact, several of these other systems, the alfalfa systems in particular, also gained carbon in the surface horizons, but lost at depth. And so this is very troubling, obviously, um, and, and calls out some really important considerations for things like carbon markets, that if we're going to base carbon markets on carbon accrual, carbon gain, uh, we better be looking across an entire soil uh, horizon, uh, an entire soil profile, 
and not base payments simply on what's happening in the surface uh, horizons. Yi Chao Rui, uh, postdoc extraordinaire, who's now a professor at Purdue University, um, came in, uh, in a couple of years ago and sampled the soils in the same experiment and um, did a bunch of fractionation work and looked at uh, different uh, parts of the system. But uh, one of the things that was very clear is that the grazed pastures, uh, while they didn't seem to be accumulating a significant amount of carbon, they did have a much higher a uh, fraction of carbon in the mineral associated organic matter pool, which we uh, refer to maybe a little loosely, but we, we refer to as persistent soil carbon. We think that carbon that's glommed onto minerals has a much better chance of sticking around for longer periods of time. Um, not to say that particulate organic matter isn't important. That is a critical part of building total carbon, uh, but we really want to get uh, as much as possible into this Mayom pool uh, in order to really keep it stuck stuck around for more than just five or 10 years, say. So that was an interesting finding. And one of the things Yi Chao pointed to was the higher carbon use efficiency in those grazed pastures. That is the microbes were actually um, uh, respiring less carbon, less CO2 to the atmosphere per unit of necromass left behind that would eventually glom onto the soil particles. So um, it's something about the microbial carbon use efficiency, why it's different, we don't know yet, whether it's a community thing or a physiology thing or both. Uh, and so we're uh, currently exploring questions around that right now. Uh, Ashley Becker is a master's student who's now working on her PhD and this is her master's work where she took a different uh, approach, an extensive approach and went around to over 30 farms in Wisconsin, all of them with rotationally grazed um, pastures. Sorry, not all of them are rotationally grazed. Some of them may have been continuously grazed, but they were all pasture systems. And worked really closely with those farmers to identify a paired comparison uh, that would be on a similar slope, similar aspect, similar soil type, et cetera, with the idea of having some sort of uh, comparison uh, between a row crop and a pasture uh, system. And the takeaway message from her work was that uh, over five tons more carbon per acre in the grazed pastures than uh, in the annual row crop systems. And there's all kinds of variation in how the pastures were managed, their rotational frequencies, whether there was rotational grazing at all. Uh, likewise, in the annual systems, some of these ac actually had a couple of years of alfalfa interspersed. There were different rotations, but they were all some sort of annual system. Uh, but you can see here that there was a lot more carbon in the surface horizon, the zero to 15 centimeters. And interestingly, from 15 to 30 centimeters, no significant differences between these pairs, indicating that she did a great job of identifying soils that were kind of similar to begin with, uh, but also pointing to uh, the importance of that surface horizon as a quick responder uh, to, to management. She also looked at the age of pastures and tried to relate that to the total amount of carbon. It gets a little dicey when you get out here to the right-hand uh, side of this plot, and it's a relatively weak signal, but a signal nonetheless, and one that she's trying to flesh out a little bit more to explore the importance of age here. And uh, there's a lot of talk uh, in pasture management in Wisconsin and, and in the upper Midwest in general around uh, when should I renovate my pasture? When should I take it out and put in, you know, tear it up and put in new, uh, new pasture. And if we're gonna liberate a bunch of the carbon or most of the carbon that we've accumulated over some period of time, we need to understand what the ramifications of that renovation are and how important it is to just keep soil intact uh, over, over decades. Finally, I, I just wanna share uh, some work that just uh, was published this last week, uh, Abby Algarten pictured here uh, was a grad student with Matt Ruark in our soils department here on campus. And uh, Abby uh, did this heroic effort of uh, collecting data from over 746 plots in Wisconsin. Uh, some of them pastures, 92 of them. Some of them forage uh, systems, which is to say uh, uh, alfalfa rotations. Uh, some of them annual systems like corn and beans that had manure added to them, and then some of them annual systems that didn't have any manure added to them. 
Now, again, within these three categories, there's all kinds of variation in the way those systems were managed, but she had collected enough data, we hope, from all those different, uh, from 214 systems or 180 systems that we could kind of overwhelm some of the variation that you might see. Um, I've listed here the uh, soil health principles, the five soil health principles, as they relate to uh, each of these categories in an effort to try and discern some patterns. Uh, you know, the, the, the pasture system, one of the reasons we love pastures, uh, and one of the reasons they restore uh, the functionality of the ecosystem is because uh, they are a fully functioning ecosystem. Uh, the soils aren't disturbed. They're uh, more or less diverse. Uh, you've got year-round cover. You've got year-round living roots. And of course, you've got livestock integrated. And uh, so having all five of those soil principles really seems to be uh, super important for uh, improving soil health. Especially if you think of soil health in a very uh, sort of narrow or rigid way, which I do, and I'll, I'll be frank about that. For me, uh, organic matter or carbon in the soil is a critical part of restoring the functionality of the system, a critical part about the system being regenerative. And so looking at soil organic matter as that main metric of soil health, uh, what you can see here is that uh, none of the systems except for pasture actually had higher organic matter. Well, that's not the way to say that. The pastures had higher organic matter than the other three uh, categories of systems, which were not significantly different. And you can see here, there's a tremendous amount of variation in organic matter in each of the systems. But on average, uh, the pastures were, were set apart. She also looked at what we call sensitive indicators of soil health. You heard about some of this in the lightning talks. And these are important metrics because we know that organic matter changes slowly and it's hard to measure and hard to quantify. Um, and so we often look at these sensitive indicators like uh, POC C, which is to say the carbon that's easily extracted from the soil or mineralizable C, which is letting the microbes show us what's uh, actually uh, labile and available. And what you see here is what you might expect that uh, there's this sort of more of a ladder of uh, improvement in soil health. Uh, so especially down here on the bottom with mineralizable C, you can see that uh, gradually as we add more and more of the soil health um, principles into systems, we're getting improvements in these sensitive indicators. But I, I just wanna caution us about these sensitive indicators. I mean, they're not, they're not what we are really managing for. What we are managing for is our improvements in organic matter, improvements in soil carbon. Uh, it's not hard to imagine that you're stimulating microbial activity without any subsequent gain in carbon. And in fact, that's what we observed here. So I think we just need to be careful with these sensitive indicators. It's not to say that they aren't useful. It's not to say that they aren't pointing in the right, in, in the right direction, but uh, and, and in fact, there's some good literature showing that things like poxy are related to yields, et cetera. Uh, but if we're talking about solar, solar organic carbon and solar organic matter, I think we have to be very careful here uh, about whether or not these indicators are actually pointing us towards uh, so-called climate smart uh, system. So uh, let me just wrap up and say that um, what's clear from our data in the upper Midwest is that annual row crops are losing soil organic carbon, even with interventions like minimum tillage and cover crops. Um, while this is a result from our particular experiment, there just aren't many uh, experiments out there that actually look at changing carbon over uh, multiple decades like we have, nor do they use an equivalent soil mass correction like we've done, I didn't get into that detail. Um, nor do they look at the entire soil depth like we've done. And in fact, if we had only published our work based on a look at the surface horizon, we would have concluded that many of these systems were gaining carbon when in fact they weren't, and uh, when in fact they were losing. Uh, Well-managed grazing on perennial grasslands promotes persistent soil organic carbon. We don't know if that's because it's making more of that accumulate or whether having more of that in the system uh, allows for less of it to be respired and less of it to be lost. Uh, still an open question that we're working on. I think I just said this, so organic carbon is either growing faster into grasslands or shrinking uh, more slowly. And 
Uh, what's pretty clear from our big survey that, that Abby uh, Algarton led, uh, all five soil health principles, uh, let's just say fully implemented, are key to healthy soil, are key to building soil. Um, so what I mean by fully implemented is, um, you know, a little bit of manure here and a little bit of manure there, uh, or cover crops that are kind of weakly uh, growing, but not really uh, providing uh, below ground um, uh, 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 production and holding on to soil are probably not going to get us where we need to be. Uh, and so when I step back and look at what does that mean? What are the implications of all five soil health principles? The implications to me are we've got to restore grassland to much of our agricultural system, to much of our ag agricultural landscape. And that's going to require us to move away from thinking about our agricultural system as a commodity system that's designed to make people money. It's got to be a system that's designed to feed people and care for people and care for the land. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions and uh, uh, listen to further conversation today. Randy, thank you so much. You've really hit on a lot of the topics that we are thinking about here in Washington, both for growers, policymakers, and scientists. Uh, we have just under 10 minutes for the q and I'm going to quickly remind everyone to click over to the Engage tab above the Zoom video stream to answer the one question survey. And then you can click back to the video um, as soon as you answer that. So we have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, let's start with, uh, I'll read it. It says, what can we reasonably expect in terms of optimum goals as we pursue food production utilizing regenerative ag systems? Can you speculate on a plateau? Can we get to native ecosystem levels or can we manage to go above that? Or will there always be or will we always be below native levels because there will always be some component of extraction? It's a big question. Yeah, great question. Well, um, whether we can whether we can restore um, the full function of the original prairie, uh, let's just stick with the upper Midwest, but I guess this would also play out for the Palouse Prairie and, and other um, short grass step and that sort of thing. Whether we can ever approach that, I, I don't know, and it seems unlikely to me, uh, but it's, it's an open question. It's an open research question, and, and uh, I'm not trying to be mealy-mouthed here, but uh, there's been some good work where we've gone around to remnant prairies in the upper Midwest. There are a few, not many, um, and looked at the soil carbon in those uh, prairies and compared them to what we see in our restored prairies and our well-managed grazing systems. And uh, we're, we're not even coming close to the amount of carbon that is in the original prairie. So I think there's a big gap there that we can try and fill. Unfortunately, what our models project, you know, where we're going with our restored systems, um, they're kind of asymptoting uh, way below what those um, native systems have in them. And so we don't know if that's, um, something about uh, a signal already from the climate. You know, the climate has been changing now for 50 years and uh, we have good, good evidence for that. And so are we just, is there a new equilibrium that is not gonna allow us to get there already? Of course, we're gonna continue to fight that as we try and build carbon. Um, and then the other thing that's, um, just to put some more flesh on that, uh, when we do go to those remnant prairies and use those as reference sites, they are almost always on really crappy, thin, uh, rocky outcrops. You know, that, those are the places that are remnant prairies, not the uh, deep mollusols that are in the, in the bottoms. So uh, they're not even really a great reference and we're not even approaching them. So I guess the answer is uh, we, we could, but I don't see that we are going to here anytime soon. That said, uh, I think it's probably enough for us to try and shoot for systems that actually accumulate carbon at all, rather than losing carbon over time. Sorry to be long-winded, Danny. No, that was great, thank you. Uh, we're also getting a lot of questions about measurements, and so I'll try to organize them here. But I think, you know, you presented research where you're measuring down to three feet and you're running all of these different indicators and, and really sort of getting at some of the nitty gritty, which of course we ideally could all do, but it's labor intensive and it's cost intensive. 
And I'm wondering what your thoughts are for some of us where our budget is limited or our staff is limited. How can we accurately measure soil carbon? Hmm. Yeah, there, I'm at the Society for Range Management meetings and there was a whole session on this yesterday and Jonathan Sanderman, in fact, uh, was, led a big conversation about this. That was really fascinating. And I, I, I'm not going to do justice to what his takeaway was, except that it was, we've got to throw everything at it. Uh, we've got to use uh, mid-infrared spectroscopy methods. We've got to use remote sensing. We've got to use boots on the ground soil sampling. Maybe this is too sciencey of an answer. Um, you know, we, we've got to try everything we can to try and capture the spatial and temporal variability. On the other hand, I think we have enough information now to know that, and this is part of my message, that annual cropping systems are not going to build carbon. They, they just aren't. Uh, they're disturbed too much. They require too many inputs. And if you actually, like um, Gary was saying, if you bring into it the embodied carbon that goes into making fertilizer, forget it, there's no chance. Um, and, and so I'm not saying like we're not going to grow any grain anywhere anytime, but uh, to have, for instance, in the upper Midwest, a system that is where 75 percent, 80 percent, I think Gary said 98 percent of Illinois is now corn and beans, which mainly gets fed to livestock that are confined in Colorado and New Mexico and Texas and into gas tanks is just ridiculous. Like we have to move away from that system if we're gonna to move towards something that's climate smart. I, I moved away from methods and more into preaching, sorry. No, that's great, thank you. Um, so we have questions about some of the individual soil health indicators. You talked a little bit about MNC and POXI, and I'm wondering if you know anything about the, the different physical fractionations we have uh, palm and mam, and for those uh, in the audience who don't know, that's mineral associated organic matter or particulate organic matter. And do you see those as more accurate or informative versus things like poxy and mincy? Mm -hmm. Well, I, it depends, this, again, not to be mealy mouth, but I guess it depends what you're interested in. Uh, if you're interested in something that's very sensitive and pointing towards improvements, say, in productivity, like I said, uh, there is some good evidence that something like poxy is, is related in annual systems to better yields over time. I don't know that it's like this amazing strong signal, but there is a signal. So if that's really what you're doing is trying to tweak an, ex an existing annual system, uh, I think that those soil health indicators are, are, are great. Um, I don't think trying to tweak those systems is great, but that's, you know, don't let me get preaching again. Uh, POM and MAM, the nice thing about them is that they're, they are something, like we know what they are. The POM is just the, you know, if you looked at POM under a scope, you would see plant cells. And uh, if you look at MAM under a scope, it's, it's dead microbial necromass, more or less. And... Um, so they're, they're real pools, in other words. So I, I, I like them because of that. There's a lot of question in the literature right now and a lot of back and forth about, uh, you know, is, is, an, is the pathway to MAOM necessarily through POM or in POM uh, or through microbes, excuse me, or can some of that POM actually just get turned into mineral associated organic matter? Uh, anyway, I, I like those pools because they are real things and they're relatively easy to quantify and relatively easy to separate. Thank you. So we have just a couple minutes left and we've, we're getting a lot of questions about management and specifically how our systems in Washington may be different than some of the ones you're describing. Um, let's pick the agroforestry question to end on here. So someone asked, what about agroforestry? Would more integration of woody crops and annuals be better for carbon stores? Right. Uh, the agroforestry one is always tricky. Uh, so what's pretty clear is that agroforestry done in places where savannas should be, where the savanna biome occurs, um, can actually improve carbon stores above what you might get in a pasture. So you get a pasture and then you get the carbon in the, in the trees and in the roots of the trees uh, in addition. 
Uh, I think there's some question about, well, how long-term is the carbon actually stored in those trees compared to the soils? And I, I don't wanna get into that. Um, so I, I think agroforestry done in the right place, in, in the appropriate place is a good thing. I don't wanna see trees planted into uh, prairies in Illinois where there never were trees. I wanna see uh, intact grasslands that are um, actually accumulating carbon and providing uh, for livestock feed. Um, annuals is tricky. I, I, it's hard for me to see how annuals are ever going to, like annuals done year after year after year, are ever going to allow carbon to accumulate. The disturbance of planting the annuals uh, and managing the annuals almost always undermines their ability to uh, accumulate carbon. Not to mention their shallow rooting systems and their, their life history overall. Okay, Randy, thank you so much. There's so many questions we didn't get to address today. People are really excited about your talk. So thank you so much.